I'm not at home on crowded streets. They don't appeal to me. In the heart of God's cathedral is where I want to be. So I take the outside circle when the stars are growing dim. See the morning light play shadows all along the canyon rim. I feel the prairie waking, flush a dozen bob white quail as I guide my favorite cow horse down a rough and rocky trail. I ride through mountain country, gaze across the great divide as I trail majestic mustangs that no man will ever ride. A red-tailed hawk is screaming as he searches for his prey. The cottonwoods are yellow on this crisp November day. I crave the open spaces where the sky is blue and wide. Somewhere west of Wall Street is where my heart and soul reside. Hi, I'm Red Stegall. Join me as we explore another trail somewhere west of Wall Street. And today, we're gonna to visit the Pitchfork Ranch. The Pitchfork Ranch is one of the old historic ranches in Texas. As told in David Murrow's book, The Pitchfork Land and Cattle Company, The First Century, the ranch was founded in 1881 when cattleman Dan Gardner and Colonel J.S. Godwin contracted to buy 2,500 head of Pitchfork branded cattle. The cattle were pastured on the South Wichita River in eastern Dickens and western King counties. Gardner and Godwin had formed a partnership with Gardner furnishing the expertise and Godwin furnishing most of the money. However, before they could take possession of the cattle, Godwin backed out of the deal due to some family problems and Gardner was left holding the bag. The purchase price was approximately $50,000, and Gardner had nowhere near that kind of money. With the threat of losing the entire deal, Gardner remembered a boyhood friend from back in Mississippi and contacted Eugene Williams. Now, Gardner and Williams had been friends almost since birth with their families owning neighboring plantations in Mississippi. The boys were only 10 years old in 1861 when the Civil War began. But as a result of the war, both families lost their plantations and went separate ways. However, Williams and Gardner remained close friends and were even so 20 years later. Williams in 1881 was vice president of the Hamilton and Brown Shoe Company in St. Louis, Missouri. But when he received word that Gardner needed help, Williams didn't hesitate and wired Gardner that he would meet him in Fort Worth. Williams and Gardner sat down with Godwin over dinner and to Godwin's surprise made a deal. When Godwin asked Williams if he didn't even want to see the cattle before he bought them, Williams replied that Gardner knew a whole lot more about cattle than he did and he was willing to put all his trust in his friend. Williams wrote Godwin a check for his share of the cattle and then got on the night train headed back to St. Louis. That was the beginning of a 47 year business relationship between Gardner and the Williams family. For the approximately $50,000 purchase price, Williams and Gardner acquired 2,600 head of Longhorns, 70 horses, and assorted wagons and camp equipment. The Pitchfork Ranch was born. Two years later, wanting to expand and needing some more capital in order to do so, Williams and Gardner took in another partner, a young St. Louis businessman named A.P. Bush, Jr. They immediately bought just under 300 more cows for the next few years, kept all their heifer calves. In 1881, the year they started the ranch, they branded 600 calves. In 1882, they branded 971. And in 1883, the Pitchfork brand was applied to 1,482 calves. By the end of 1883, there were more than 6,000 cows, calves, and steers that carried the image of a pitchfork on their sides. By this time, the area on which the partners were running their cattle was starting to become crowded. The Pitchfork Partnership owned very little of the land on which their cattle grazed, taking advantage of the free-range grazing that was customary at the time. But with other ranchers moving in, Williams, Gardner, and Bush knew they needed to get title of some more land. A neighbor, Samuel Lazarus, owned 52,000 acres in Dickens and King counties, about half of which was being grazed by Pitchfork cattle. And in December 1883, a merger of the two operations was agreed upon. The result was a new corporation, the Pitchfork Land and Cattle Company. Williams then persuaded his business partners in the shoe company, A.D. Brown and W.H. Carroll, to invest in the new corporation. The six partners named themselves directors in the corporation and decided that four officers, including a general manager, were to direct the affairs of the company. 
Brown was named president, and Williams was vice president. Bush was secretary treasurer, and Gardner was general manager. What those six men put together in 1883 has now lasted 130 years. Gardner continued to run the ranch until his death in 1928. You folks stay with us. We'll talk more about the cattle and the horses of the Pitchfork Landing Cattle Company when we come back. Don't you go anywhere. Well, there were 70 horses included with the purchase of the first cattle. And the Pitchfork always had horses on which to work for cattle, although for the first 50 years of its operation, the ranch relied on native or Spanish horses for the cowboys. However, the Williams brothers, the first Eugene Williams sons, were avid polo players. And after the death of Dan Gardner, they introduced to the ranch both thoroughbred mares and stallions. And they took advantage of the government's remount horse program. Where the U.S. Army would furnish a thoroughbred stallion to the ranch, the ranch would breed him to their mares, and the Army would get first pick of the foals, which they would buy from the ranch. The stallion was free, and the ranch kept any foals the Army didn't buy. And among those thoroughbred stallions the ranch used as a part of the program were Trimmer, a son of Mad Hatter by Fair Play and Bit Boulder by Canard. For a few years, even the Pitchfork Cowboys fielded a polo team, but the thoroughbreds did little as far as producing a cow horse. Rudolph Swenson, who had become ranch manager in 1940, wanted to introduce quarter horse blood into the ranch's broodmare band, and in 1941 bought a horse called Seal Brown. Seal Brown was by Golden Chief and was a product of R.L. Underwood's breeding. Underwood lived in Wichita Falls and at the time was president of the new American Quarter Horse Association. After a few years, Seal Brown, with the addition of his daughters, had greatly improved the ranch's broodmare band, and when he died in 1946, the ranch purchased Joe Bailey's King from the neighboring Four Sixes Ranch. Joe Bailey's King was by Joe Bailey, which AQHA had deemed to be one of its foundation stallions. As a result, Joe Bailey received the number four in the AQHA registry. Joe Bailey's King was a gray, as were the majority of his foals, and that led to the coining of the term pitchfork grays. It wasn't long before nearly all the cowboys on the ranch were riding gray horses. Joe Bailey's King became the foundation stallion for pitchfork horses, and today, approximately 70% of the broodmares on the ranch are descendants of his. Another early stallion that the ranch used was Reno Badger, who was by Gray Badger III. Reno Badger was also a gray stallion, and Gray Badger III was by Gray Badger II, which was another good sire of cow horses that the Four Sixes had. In 1963, the ranch had its first horse sale, selling 50 ranch horses for an average of $599 apiece, a nice price for a ranch horse at the time. The next year, they sold 55 horses for a total of $30,750, including $1,585 for a horse called Cash Coal. According to Billy George Drennan, who for 31 years was wagon boss at the Pitchfork, Cash Coal was a good horse that they bred a lot of mares to. Cash Coal was by Spot Cash and was a product of Hank Weiskamp's breeding. Spot Cash was by Skipper W and out of a daughter applauded, an old-time foundation breeding. In 1964, the ranch sent one of the good daughters of Joe Bailey's king to breed to Oto and named the foal a sorrel stallion, Forco. Oto was by Sugar Bars, and his foals have earned thousands of points in performance events and AQHA competition. Billy George trained Forco for cutting and showed him in the 1967 National Cutting Horse Association Futurity before bringing him home and turning him out with a band of brood mares. Billy George said that Forco was a great sire roping and cow horses, and although Forco was killed in a highway accident at a relatively young age, he too became part of the foundation of the Pitchfork Horses. Some of the mares in the brood mare band today are descendants of Forco. Through the years, the ranch has employed the breeding of other horses, such as Savannah Jr., Gray Starlight, C.D. Olina, Highbrow Cat, and Dash for Cash in their efforts to produce a good cow horse. The 181,000-acre ranch is still controlled by the descendants of Eugene Williams, and only seven managers have followed founder Dan Gardner. Today's manager is Brooks Hodges, who lives with his family at the headquarters of the ranch and works hard to maintain the tradition set forth 130 years ago by Williams and Gardner. 
Stay with us. We're going to visit with Brooks and talk about his challenges of ranching in West Texas. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We learned a little bit about the history of the world famous Pitchfork Ranch, and now we're at the ranch itself, and we're going to visit with Brooks Hodges, the general manager of the Pitchfork, and we're going to talk about a lot of different things, the horses, uh, the country, his challenges to overcome drought and fires. And Brooks, to begin with, give us a little background about your, you and how you came to Cowboy. I, was, uh, I wasn't raised on a ranch uh, as a kid, but, but uh, we was always around horses, and we always had horses, my family, and my dad always had us kids out there riding when we was little, and little play days and this and that. And, and uh, I always just thought the life of a cowboy would be pretty neat to be a part of. And, and uh, when I was oh, 12, 13, somewhere in there, I went to work on a little ranch there north of Bushland, kind of outside of Amarillo on the weekends and on the holidays and stuff. And Dripping Springs Cattle Company is the name of that deal. And an old man there by the name of Darrell Winterfield kind of took me and my brother in and we'd, uh, we'd trot around and look at yearlings. And, and uh, he really was kind of the first one to ever probably show me some of the ethics and things as, as far as cowboying goes, you know, and and uh, started started instilling those you know those good qualities that you learn, I guess, really from being a part of that deal. Yes. Well, when you got here, you had some real challenges. Uh, that was uh, the year you got here was the big drought. I mean, a real big drought, and a lot of cattle were shipped off out of this country up north where there was grass because there wasn't any here. And then what grass was left, a lot of it burned off. Yes, and uh, we're going to talk about that in, in a little bit because we're going to go out there and, and see how that country has recovered. Yeah. One thing I want to talk to you about is your horse program. And the Pitchfork horses have made a great impression on the quarter horse breed through several generations. And what do you look for in a horse today? What, what's the genetics of your mare herd and why do you select per, uh, particular horses to nick on those, if they'll nick on those mares and preserve your genetics and, and move it forward. Yes, sir. You know, the. I think uh, I'm, I'm blessed to be the sixth, I believe the sixth general manager on this ranch. And, and uh, the five or so guys in front of me for the past 130 years did a bang up job, I think. And in uh, and, and starting a horse program and trying to bring in different genetics through the past 100 years, you know, and, and try to build a broodmare band off of those. and and not really chasing a trend as they went forward, but just tried to produce a good quality horse that would work for this ranch. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if it worked good here and, and was able to, you know, provide a tool to these cowboys to do their job, and uh, if you had one that was special enough to kind of get outside and, and maybe do good in an arena or a ranch horse deal, well, that was just kind of gravy, you know. But their, their number one job was to take care of these cows and and uh, just kind of another tool in the toolbox, if you will. But, you know, they, I don't, I don't think that there's anything that I'd want to really say that I'd do to change what them guys did, because what they did was good, and it, it worked. And so I, I think what I would look at moving forward maybe is, is just to try to introduce maybe some, some of these newer bloods that, you know, bloodlines that are out there today or that maybe that maybe D. Burns didn't have in 1940, sure. you know, and things like that, and, and bring those bring those newer bloodlines in and cross them with the foundation that's there, back to the Joe Bailey Kings and mm -hmm. the you know the preferred pays and and those Seal Brown and and I remember looking back at some of the pedigrees on some of the the mares that came from the Pitchfork, and there was a, a horse called Gray D. Bar back there. Mm -hmm. It was by yes, Sea Bars, I think. It yes, was. sir. That's right. And you had a great stud here named Cat Silver. Yes, sir. You know that horse. I, I'm, I'm, they bought that horse in 2002 uh, from around the Bridgeport area, somewhere around Decatur, somewhere Bridgeport, I think. And uh, they brought that horse in here, and and he was a gray stud, and that was important, I think, when Bob probably bought him was to kind of help hold to some of that gray, you know, pitchfork tradition, but but he was a good pony at that too. And and they brought him in here and, and, and did the same thing. They crossed him on some of them old Sir Sir mares 
which goes back to your uh, Savannah Junior, and some of them horses that was you know back in the '60s, and and uh, they went to crossing him on them kind of mares, and and has just made some really really good athletes for this ranch. And that horse he throws a lot of cow, and uh, just a lot of ability, and he, he's real gentle, had a good disposition, and and uh, I I haven't rode many of them colts. There's a lot of people before me that rode a bunch of them. And, uh, but I've rode, you know, three or four of them, and I, I sure I sure like every one of them. What are the other studs you're, you're riding? There's a, there's a gray starlight stud out there named Tejon, and uh, he's going to be kind of your bigger, ranchier type horse. He throws a big old bottom in them coats. They, they might be a little bronchy to start, and uh, but once I've never started one, but what the guys tell me now, <laughs> when, uh, when, when they kind of get him over that, that hump, kind of get him over them first, you know, 30, 60 days, them, them horses just got a big bottom and can make some of these big drives and big gathers out here and, and, and make good using ranch horses. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, we brought in, uh, I didn't, but, but pre me, they brought in a C.D. Alina stud, um, own son of C.D. Alina. And, and his colts are coming to this year, and so we'll be able to uh, maybe get them started and kind of see what they're going to be like. And we've got a one-time Pepto stud that's just now too, and you know we'll be able to one of these days see what he's his yeah. colts are like. And got a sophisticated cat little stud, and, and uh, so it'll be interesting to see how some of these newer horses cross on some of these old mares. And 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 I I tell you I I like to every year try to buy. Uh, two or three mares, you know, go to these fraturity sales or something and, and try to buy you two or three good, you know, kind of middle-aged brood mare that might be bred to something a little different than what we had and uh, and bring those mares in and, and incorporate them with our foundation, you know, mare band and and uh, just try to bring in a little new blood and then we can kind of just play with it and see what works and what doesn't work, I guess. And there are plenty of them out there to choose from. Yes, sir. But of course, we all know that the genetics of that broodmare band is the single most important element in the success of your, your breeding program. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, you had some challenges with, with fire and drought. And I want to take a break right now, and I want to run out and take a look uh, out in the country and see how the pasture's recovered, and we'll talk about your challenges there. Brooks, the fire went all through here and we've got a bush in front of us that never has recovered. Some of the mesquite behind us is recovering, and uh, but there's a lot of dead wood in there, and a, lot of, a lot of burned wood. As we look out across the horizon, my goodness, this was this is big country. Yes, sir. Burned off a lot of country, didn't yes, it? Yes, sir. It did. That fire took about 90,000 acres from us. Off this ranch? Yes, sir. Right off this ranch. 89-something thousand acres. And how long did it take it? To get to this point, two years? It, yes, sir. About two and two and a half so far. You know, we we entered the, the fire was April May of uh, 2011, and that's kind of about the same time we entered the drought of the century all at once. So, not only did we not have any growth come back, typically like you might yes. after a normal fire, because it sat dry for two years, and finally we've been catching some rains past three four months here, and 13's been good to us and had a good summer and hadn't had so many consecutive days being so hot you know this year as it has been in the past so we've, we're still still a little green and showing uh, showing some grass growth which uh, looks good to me well it looks good to yes, me sir. and it and it's coming back it's really trying to fill in the bare spots yes sir and it'll take some more time and some more rain but my gosh it's it's coming back good Thanks for riding along with us. We hope we taught you something about the cowboy you didn't know or maybe brought back an old memory. Until we meet again, I want to leave you with something to think about. The man who doesn't read good books has no advantage over the man who can't read them. Mark Twain said that. Be sure and listen for us on your local radio station for Cowboy Corner. And join us right here next week as we explore another trail somewhere west of Wall Street.